Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we begin with part one, Forward and Introduction, from The Meaning of Masonry by W. L. Wilmshurst. The Meaning of Masonry, W. L. Wilmshurst, Past Master, 275, Past Provincial Grand Registrar, West Yorkshire. We must then demonstrate that ours is a hierarchy of inspired, divine and deifying science, of efficacy and of consecration, for those initiated with the initiation of the revelation derived from the hierarchical mysteries. Head of this hierarchy is the fountain of life, the essence of goodness, the one triad, cause of things that be, assimilation to and union with whom as far as attainable is deification. And this is the common goal of every hierarchy, persistent devotion towards God and divine things divinely and uniformly ministered, prior to which there must be a complete and unswerving removal of things contrary, a knowledge of things as they are in themselves, the vision and science of sacred truth, the inspired communication of the uniform perfection of the one itself as far as attainable, the banquet of contemplation, nourishing intelligibly and deifying every man elevated towards it. Dionysius Areopagiticus. Forward. Freemasonry has had many great scholars who devoted their time and talents to the philosophical exposition of the character of the craft, the meaning of craft symbols, and the religious aspects of the fraternity. Albert Pike, Robert Freak Gould, Fort Newton, Albert Gallatin Mackey, and W. L. Wilmshurst. Walter Leslie Wilmshurst, 1867 to 1939, was a mystic with a practical knowledge and profound understanding of the religions of the world. The meaning of masonry discloses the real purpose of modern Freemasonry and clearly states the true body of teaching and practice concerning the esoteric meanings of Masonic ritual. Freemasonry is based on the three great principles, brotherly love, relief, and truth. Over the years, brotherly love and relief have been so stressed that the craft is in serious danger of becoming primarily a social and charitable organization. Truth, the most difficult principle to recognize and thus the most difficult to achieve, has long been neglected. Wilmshurst carefully places his designs upon the trestle board to build his thesis that the Alpha and Omega of Freemasonry is not the repetition of the ritual, nor the safeguarding of secrets, but the regeneration of the brethren. This book implores the reader to learn to see in Freemasonry something more than a parochial system, enjoining elementary morality, performing perfunctory and insignificant rites, and serving as an agreeable accessory to social life. The greater system of spiritual doctrine contained in the rituals is strongly emphasized. The meaning of masonry was written with a view toward promoting a deeper understanding of the fraternity, and this goal has been achieved. The ideals of the Masonic fraternity have a wide appeal to the best instincts of men, and the craft has become one of the greatest social institutions in the world. In this new Aquarian age, when many individuals and groups are working in various ways for the eventual restoration of the mysteries, an increasing number of aspirants are beginning to recognize that Freemasonry may well be the vehicle for this achievement. We have here a sincere effort by a learned and earnest brother to point to the source of Masonic light in elegant and at times profound language. They who look with him may enjoy the same felicity. The great value of this book is that it was written by one who sets an example for all masters of lodges. His was a soul filled with the wonder of wisdom, strength, and beauty. In these pages, he whispers the password to those of us who still clamor at the gate, enabling us to enter that inner chamber where we can join the true initiates and share experiences now veiled from all but a handful of brethren. July 1980. Alan Boudreaux, PhD curator and librarian, Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of the State of New York. Introduction. The position and possibilities of the Masonic Order. The papers here collected are written solely for members of the Masonic Order, constituted under the United Grand Lodge of England. To all such they are offered in the best spirit of fraternity and goodwill, and with the wish to render to the order some small return for the profit the author has received from his association with it, extending over 32 years. They have been written with a view to promoting the deeper understanding of the meaning of masonry, to providing the explanation of it that one constantly hears called for and that becomes all the more necessary in view of the unprecedented increase of interest in 
and membership of the order at the present day. The meaning of masonry, however, is a subject usually left entirely unexpounded and that accordingly remains largely unrealized by its members, save such few as make it their private study. The authorities of what in all other respects is an elaborately organized and admirably controlled community have hitherto made no provision for explaining and teaching the noble science which masonry proclaims itself to be and was certainly designed to impart. It seems taken for granted that reception into the order will automatically be accompanied by an ability to appreciate forthwith and at its full value all that one there finds. The contrary is the case for masonry is a veiled and cryptic expression of the difficult science of spirit life and the understanding of it calls for special informed guidance on the one hand and on other a genuine and earnest desire for knowledge and no small capacity for spiritual perception on part of those seeking to be instructed and infrequently one finds brethren discontinuing their interest or their membership because they find that masonry means nothing to them and that explanation or guidance is vouchsafed them. Were such instruction provided, assimilated and responded to, the life of the order would be enormously quickened and deepened and its efficiency as a means of initiation intensified, whilst incidentally the fact would prove an added safeguard against the admission into the order of unsuitable members, which is meant not merely persons who fail to satisfy conventional qualifications, but also those who, whilst fitted in these respects, are as yet either so intellectually or spiritually unprogressed as to incapable of benefiting from initiation in its true sense, although passing formally through initiation rites. Spiritual quality rather than numbers, ability to understand the Masonic system and reduce implications into personal experience rather than perfunctory conferment of its rights, are the desiderata of the craft today. As a contribution to repairing the absence explanation referred to, these papers have been compiled. The first two of them have often been read as lectures at lodge meetings. Many requests that they should be printed and made more widely available led to my expanding their subject matter into greater detail than could be used for occasional lectures, and accordingly they are here amplified by a paper containing fuller notes upon craft symbolism. To complete the consideration of the craft system, it was necessary also to add a chapter upon that which forms the crown and culmination of the craft degrees, and without which they would be imperfect, the order of the royal arch. Lastly, a chapter has been added upon the important subject, which forms the background of the rest, the relationship of modern masonry to the ancient mysteries, from which it is the direct, though greatly attenuated, spiritual descendant. Thus, in the five papers, I've sought to provide a survey of the whole Masonic subject as expressed by the craft and arch degrees, which it is hoped may prove illuminating to the increasing number of brethren who feel that Freemasonry enshrines something deeper and greater than in the absence of guidance they have been able to realize. It does not profess to be more than an elementary and far from exhaustive survey. The subject might be treated much more fully in more technical terminology and with abundant references to authorities were one compiling a more ambitious and scholarly treatise. But to the average Mason, such a treatise would probably prove less serviceable than a summary expressed in as simple and untechnical terms as may be, and unburdened by numerous literary references. Some repetition due to the papers having been written at different times may be found in later chapters of points already dealt with in previous ones though the restatement may be advantageous in emphasizing those points and maintaining continuity of exposition. For reasons explained in the chapter itself, that on the Holy Royal Arch will probably prove difficult of comprehension by those unversed in the literature and psychology of religious mysticism. If so, the reading of it may be deferred or neglected. But since a survey of the Masonic system would, like the system itself, be incomplete without reference to that supreme degree, and since that degree deals with matters of advanced psychological and spiritual experience about which explanation must always be difficult, the subject has been treated here with as much simplicity of statement as is possible, and rather with a view to indicating to what great heights of spiritual attainment the craft degrees point as achievable, than with the expectation that they will be readily comprehended by readers without some measure of mystical experience and perhaps unfamiliar with the testimony of the mystics thereto.
Purposely, these papers avoid dealing with matters of craft history and of merely antiquarian or archaeological interest. Dates, particulars of Masonic constitutions, historical changes and developments in the external aspects of the craft, references to old lodges and the names of outstanding people connected therewith. These and such like matters can be read about elsewhere. They are all subordinate to what alone is a vital moment and what so many brethren are hungering for. Knowledge of the spiritual purpose and lineage of the order and the present day value of rites of initiation. In giving these pages to publication, care has been taken to observe due reticence in respect of essential matters. The general nature of the Masonic system is, however, nowadays widely known to outsiders and easily ascertainable from many printed sources, whilst the large interest in and output of literature upon mystical religion and the science of the inward life during the last few years has familiarized many with a subject of which, as is shown in these papers, masonry is but a specialized form. To explain masonry in general outline is, therefore, not to divulge a subject which is entirely exclusive to its members, but merely to show that masonry stands in line with other doctrinal systems, inculcating the same principles and to which no secrecy attaches, and that it is a specialized and highly effective method of inculcating those principles. Truth, whether as expressed in masonry or otherwise, is at all times an open secret, but is as a pillar of light to those able to receive and profit by it, and to all others, but one of darkness and unintelligibility. An elementary and formal secrecy is requisite as a practical precaution against the intrusion of improper persons and for preventing profanation. In other respects, the vital secrets of life and of any system expounding life protect themselves, even though shouted from the housetops, because they mean nothing to those as yet unqualified for the knowledge and unready to identify themselves with it by incorporating it into their habitual thought and conduct. In view of the great spread and popularity of masonry today, when there are some 3,000 lodges in Great Britain alone, it is as well to consider its present bearings and tendencies and to give a thought to future possibilities. The Order is a semi-secret, semi-public institution, secret in respect of its activities intra Moenia, but otherwise of full public notoriety, with its doors open to any applicant for admission who is of ordinary good character and repute. Those who enter it, as the majority do, entirely ignorant of what they will find there, usually because they have friends there or know masonry to be an institution devoted to high ideals and benevolence and with which it may be socially desirable to be connected, may or may not be attracted and profit by what is disclosed to them, and may or may not see anything beyond the bare form of the symbol or hear anything beyond the mere letter of the word. Their admission is quite a lottery, their initiation too often remains but a formality, not an actual awakening into an order and quality of life previously unexperienced. Their membership, unless such an awakening eventually ensues from the careful study and faithful practice of the order's teaching, has little, if any, greater influence upon them than would ensue from their joining a purely social club. For initiation, for which there are so many candidates little conscious of what is implied in that for which they ask, what does it really mean and intend? It means a new beginning, initium, a breakaway from an old method and order of life and the entrance upon a new one of larger self-knowledge, deepened understanding and intensified virtue. It means a transition from the merely natural state and standards of life towards a regenerate and supernatural state and standard. It means a turning away from the pursuit of the popular ideals of the outer world in the conviction that those ideals are but shadows, images and temporal substitutions for the eternal reality that underlies them, to the keen and undivertible quest of that reality itself and the recovery of those genuine secrets of our being which lie buried and hidden at the center or innermost part of our souls. It means the awakening of those hitherto dormant, higher faculties of the soul which endue their possessor with light in the form of new enhanced consciousness and enlarged perceptive faculty. And lastly, in words with which every Mason is familiar, it means that the postulant will henceforth dedicate and devote his life to the divine rather than to his own or any other service, so that by the principles of the order he may be the better enabled to display that beauty of godliness which previously perhaps has not manifested through him. To comply with this definition of initiation, which it might be useful to apply as a test not only to those who seek for admission into the order, but to ourselves who are already within it, 
It is obvious that special qualifications of mind and intention are essential in a candidate of the type likely to be benefited by the order in the way that its doctrine contemplates, and that it is not necessarily the ordinary man of the world, personal friend and good fellow though he be, according to usual social standards, who is either properly prepared for or likely to benefit in any vital sense by reception into it. The true candidate must indeed needs be, as the word candidus implies, a white man white within as symbolically he is white vestured without, so that no inward stain or soilure may obstruct the dawn within his soul of that light which he professes to be the predominant wish of his heart on asking for admission. Whilst if really desirous of learning the secrets and mysteries of his own being, he must be prepared to divest himself of all past preconceptions and thought habits, and with childlike meekness and docility, surrender his mind to the reception of some perhaps novel and unexpected truths which initiation promises to impart and which will more and more unfold and justify themselves within those, and those only, who are and continue to keep themselves properly prepared for them. Know thyself was the injunction inscribed over the portals of ancient temples of initiation, for with that knowledge was promised the knowledge of all secrets and all mysteries. And masonry was designed to teach self-knowledge, but self-knowledge involves a knowledge much deeper, vaster, and more difficult than is popularly conceived. It is not to be acquired by the formal passage through three or four degrees in as many months. It is a knowledge impossible of full achievement until knowledge of every other kind has been laid aside and a difficult path of life long and strenuously pursued that alone fits and leads its followers to its attainment. The wisest and most advanced of us is perhaps still but an entered apprentice at this knowledge, however high his titular rank. Here and there may be one worthy of being hailed as a fellow craft in the true sense, the full master mason, the just man made perfect, who has actually and not merely ceremonially traveled the entire path, endured all its tests and ordeals, and become raised into conscious union with the author and Masonic giver of life and able to mediate and impart that order life to others is at all times hard to find. So high, so ideal an attainment it may be urged is beyond our reach. We are but ordinary men of the world sufficiently occupied already with our primary civic, social and family obligations and following the obvious normal path of natural life. Granted, nevertheless, to point to that attainment as possible to us and as our destiny, to indicate that path of self-perfecting to those who care and dare to follow it, modern speculative masonry was instituted and to emphasizing the fact these papers are devoted. For masonry means this, or it means nothing worth the serious pursuit of thoughtful men, nothing that cannot be pursued as well outside the craft as within it. It proclaims the fact that there exists a higher and more secret path of life than that which we normally tread, and that when the outer world and its pursuits and rewards lose their attractiveness for us and prove insufficient to our deeper needs, as sooner or later they will, we are compelled to turn back upon ourselves to seek and knock at the door of a world within. And it is upon this inner world and the path to and through it that masonry promises light, charts the way, and indicates the qualifications and conditions of progress. This is the sole aim and intention of masonry. Behind its more elementary and obvious symbolism, behind its counsels to virtue and conventional morality, behind the platitudes and unsententious phraseology, which nowadays might well be subjected to competent and intelligent revision, with which, after the fashion of their day, the 18th century compilers of its ceremonies clothed its teaching, there exists the framework of a scheme of initiation into that higher path of life where alone the secrets and mysteries of our being are to be learned. A scheme, moreover, that as will be shown later in these pages, reproduces for the modern world the main features of the ancient mysteries, and that has been well described by a learned writer on the subject as an epitome or reflection at a far distance of the once universal science. But because for long and for many, masonry has meant less than this, it has not as yet fulfilled its original purpose of being the efficient initiating instrument it was designed to be. Its energies have been diverted from its true instructional purpose into social and philanthropic channels, excellent in their way, but foreign to and accretions upon the primal main intention. Indeed, so little perceived or appreciated is that central intention that one frequently hears it confessed by men of eminent position in the craft, 
and warm devotion to it that only their interest in its great charitable institutions keeps alive their connection with the order. Relief is indeed a duty incumbent upon a mason, but its Masonic interpretation is not meant to be limited to physical necessities. The spiritually as well as the financially poor and distressed are always with us and to the former, equally with the latter, masonry was designed to minister. Theoretically, every man upon reception into the craft acknowledges himself as within the category of the spiritually poor and as content to renounce all temporal riches if haply by that sacrifice his hungry heart may be filled with those good things which money cannot purchase, but to which the truly initiated can help him. But if masonry has not as yet fulfilled its primary purpose, and though engaged in admirable secondary activities, is as yet an initiating instrument of low efficiency, it may be that, with enlarged understanding of its designs, that efficiency may yet become very considerably increased. During the last two centuries, the craft has been gradually developing from small and crude beginnings into its present vast and highly elaborated organization. Today, the number of lodges and the membership of the craft are increasing beyond all precedent. One asks oneself what this growing interest portends and to what it will or can be made to lead. The growth synchronizes with a corresponding defection of interest in orthodox religion and public worship. It need not now be inquired whether or to what extent the simple principles of faith and the humanitarian ideals of masonry are with some men taking the place of the theology offered in the various churches. It is probable that to some extent they do so. But the fact is with us that the ideals of the Masonic order are making a wide appeal to the best instincts of large numbers of men and that the order has imperceptibly become the greatest social institution in the empire. Its principles of faith and ethics are simple and a virtually universal acceptance. Providing means for the expression of universal fraternity under a common divine fatherhood and of a common loyalty to the headship and established government of the state, it leaves room for divergences of private belief and view upon matters upon which unity is impracticable and perhaps undesirable. It is utterly clean of politics and political intrigue, but nevertheless has unconsciously become a real, though unobtrusive, asset of political value, both in stabilizing the social fabric and tending to foster international amity. The elaborateness of its organization, the care and admirable control of its affairs by its higher authorities are praiseworthy in the extreme, whilst in the conduct of its individual lodges there has been and is a progressive endeavor to raise the standard of ceremonial work to a far higher degree of reverence and intelligence than was perhaps possible under conditions existing not long ago. The Masonic craft has grown and ramified to dimensions undreamed of by its original founders and at its present rate of increase, its potentialities and influence in the future are quite incalculable. What seems now needed to intensify the worth and usefulness of this great brotherhood is to deepen its understanding of its own system to educate its members in the deeper meaning and true purpose of its rites and its philosophy. Were this achieved, the Masonic order would become, in proportion to that achievement, a spiritual force greater than it can ever be so long as it continues content with a formal and unintelligent perpetuation of rites, the real and sacred purpose of which remains largely unperceived, and participation in which too often means nothing more than association with an agreeable, semi-religious social institution. Carried to its fullest, that achievement would involve the revival in a form adapted to modern conditions of the ancient wisdom teaching and the practice of those mysteries which became prescribed 15 centuries ago, but of which modern masonry is the direct and representative descendant, as will appear later in these pages. The future development and the value of the order as a moral force in society depend therefore upon the view its members take of their system. If they do not spiritualize it, they will but increasingly materialize it. If they fail to interpret its veiled purport, to enter into the understanding of its underlying philosophy and to translate its symbolism into what is signified thereby, they will be mistaking shadow for substance, a husk for the kernel, and secularizing what was designed as a means of spiritual instruction and grace it is from lack of instruction rather than of desire to learn the meaning of masonry that the craft suffers today. But as one finds everywhere, that desire exists. And so for what they may be worth, these papers are offered to the craft as a contribution towards satisfying it. 
Let me conclude with an apologue and an aspiration. In the Chronicles of Israel, it may be read how that, after long preparatory labor, after employing the choicest material and the most skillful artificers, Solomon the king at last made an end of building and beautifying his temple and dedicated to the service of the Most High that work of his hands in a state as perfect as human provision could make it. And how that then, but not till then, his offering was accepted and the acceptance was signified by a divine descent upon it so that the glory of the Lord shone through and filled the whole house. So, if we will have it so, may it be with the temple of the Masonic order. Since the inception of speculative masonry, it has been a building and expanding now these last 300 years. Fashioned of living stones into a far-reaching organic structure, brought gradually under the good guidance of its rulers to high perfection on its temporal side and in respect of its external observances, and made available for high purposes and giving godly witness in a dark and troubled world. Upon these preliminary efforts, let there now be invoked this crowning and completing blessing that the spirit of wisdom and understanding may descend upon the work of our hands in abundant measure, prospering it still farther and filling and transfiguring our whole Masonic house. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.